very impressed with the forest around your facilities here. I had to keep encouraging to keep driving. <laughs> he didn't believe I really wanted to go into the forest. So, um, But they're very nice facilities. And David and I recently met and spoke a few, few months ago and to arrange this discussion and um, realize uh, there's not a lot of, uh, not yet a lot of interaction between C4 and PT Recce. And I, I take this as the first opportunity that perhaps this can open doors between PT Recce, a restoration forest tree concession, to be, to utilize uh, your skills, your knowledge, and we welcome you to come visit us, yeah, in the future. So we hope this can open some doors for, for further co communications. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm, uh, Prior to working for April, the pulp and paper special in fire management, and that's what brought me to Indonesia was was forest fire management. The presentation um, based upon my 14 years of time here in Indonesia working in fire and land management. Um, this time is been spent um, in East Kalimantan with GTZ, uh, 10 years or so in Riau with uh, and uh, the past two years in uh, Jambi and Sumsel with PT Recce. If you're not familiar with the GT, GTZ had a project in Kalimantan for 10 years, a little over 10 years. They had three main uh, components to that project, fire prevention, information, and operations. I was involved in the operations aspects. The prevention, of course, was studying and analyzing the situation. This is starting in 1993 and trying to develop methodologies for preventing fires. The information side was focused on hotspot data, uh, mapping, um, satellite imagery, remote sensing, um, and, and fire danger rating systems. And the operations side, which is where I was involved, was focused on infrastructure and ca uh, capabilities to suppress fires. The fires of 1997-98 focused the project when 5.2 million hectares of East Kalimantan burned. This uh, diverted the project from its original goals and made a, made a huge uh, impact on, on how their, their future was going to move ahead. <clears throat> the main prod aspects of the operations section, which I was working in, were focused on, of course, um, constructing fire centers so that there was capabilities to respond to future fires after this incident, um, training staff, you know, getting and other related institutions like the concessionaires, um, establishing management systems and supporting the concessionaires to prevent this from happening or responding to such fires in the future. What this eventually led to, this, this project, was an institutionalization of fire management in East Kalimantan, meaning an UPTD was established in Dinas Keotanan, uh, Perpinsi, Kalimantan, Timor. Um, and this was the precursors, actually, of Mangala Agni, which is now operating fully and out throughout the, uh, the fire-prone provinces of Indonesia. The GTZ project was, as far as I'm aware, one of the first projects to begin mapping hotspots and assigning blame to the concessionaires. And this was some early data. I still had available on my, my hard drive. But um, they, they use this data to document the causes and, 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 the, and the who to accuse, who's doing the burning. From the operations side, again, we were built uh, 13 different fire centers with the close cooperation of the local government themselves in all the major um, districts and, and towns of East Kalimantan. And you can see most of them are on the coast up and down the coastline where the Ibu Kotas are for all the regencies. Um, we also staffed the, or they, we, we had the Dinas Keotana from each regency staff these and we provided equipment. So to give a, if you will, a surge of input to build up capability, this all started uh, after the, the 1997 event. This is examples of the equipment brought in and you know, it's, it's quite a huge effort for any project to, to deliver such, such things, and this, this took quite a bit of time. And all the appropriate SOPs and training, um, and actually physically trying to get people out in the forest. These are government employees fighting fires and coordinating with other, 
with other companies, actually. In the end, at the conclusion of the project, this is from some official documentation, <coughs> this is a summary of the fire causes as determined from the GTZ project in Kalimantan. It sort of evolved um, with, the, at the, with the knowledge at that time. And, and each of these periods that are noted here are also linked to the major fire years and also to El Nino events. And since the beginning, uh, 82, 83, I guess I put the date in wrong there, 82, 83, um, everything was attributed to slash and burn farmers. And this was reiterated again in the 1987 event. Um, in, 90, in the early 90s, there was some acknowledgement of other land users, but not really an openness um, to exactly who or why. Um, in the 93, 94 event, um, the primary focus remained blaming slash and burn farmers. 97, 98 event, uh, subsequent to the, with the hotspot data and, and, and mapping efforts, um, there was some acknowledgement that large-scale land clearing was occurring, um, especially dominated by the oil palm industry, and especially the mega rice project in 97, 98. And in 2001 and 2, um, more and more transparency began to develop in the country um, and, and through the efforts of this project, the GTZ project, which helped some of this. But there was still a lack of clarity, intentionally, of who's causing the problems. Yeah? Politicians, policymakers, and others were trying to apportion blame, but not really focusing who, who's doing what. Um, and even from my own experience, I wasn't clear either, <laughs> being new at this time in the early 2000s. <clears throat> Moving on to the next. April. This is where I spent 10 years of my career with the intention of improving capabilities um, within a company. Previously, I was working with government, and honestly, I found personally that working with the government on such issues was ineffective because who's managing the land? It's the companies, not the government. The companies use the land. They develop the land use plans. And uh, so I, I made a personal decision to join a company to improve the capabilities instead of being an advisor to a government agency which attempted to tell the companies what to do. So make improvements from within. You may, know, you may or may not know about April. They're a very large pulp and paper company since 1993 in Riel. Um, I have not worked there in over two years, so some of my data here may be a little dated. Um, but uh, at the time when I left, they were approaching a half a million hectares of planted area. Um, they utilize 10 and a half million tons of wood a year in their pulp mill. And they produce uh, over 2 million tons of pulp and close to a million tons of uh, paper each year now. I think they've got a new paper machine online. In the fire management circles, April divided their concessions into regions from a basically operational efficiency standpoint. And this is the area of land that, uh, that they were managing, different parcels. The mill is physically located right here in the center. And so they would be bringing in wood from all directions uh, to the center where the mill is. Again, when I left, um, this is slightly before I left there, they, had, they were identifying about 900,000 hectares total land base, uh, about 490 plantable, but at the time not yet planted fully. Um, the thing to note here is uh, about 15% of their land base they did not have any control of. It was outside of their control. And I know this for a fact. <laughs> and I think that's even higher today, to some degree. Um, despite the concession boundaries you may see on a map, 15 to 20% of the land is not controlled by the company. Um, other areas, like designated conservation in their concession, that they're not harvesting on, are also somewhat out of control for these companies, the local people utilize it. And then this is another area of cat land use category. In Bahasa we say Tanaman Ungulan. Um, and this is area they must designate in their land base. Um, 
And this also has some level of lack of control by the company itself because it's still natural forest. So there's a significant portion of land within a concession that a company is not directly utilizing is the point of this. This is the area of land, 55%, that, the, that a large company like this is physically managing for their financial benefit, yeah, for their, for their business. What I'm saying is not the official company line any longer. It's what, I'm, it's what I view what, what's, what's happening, yeah. We all know what's happened in Sumatra over the years, a continual decrease in forest cover, and it's even smaller today. I would love to update this with your help to get current information. I'm sure this would be an easy task, but to, to help document some of these things. Yeah. Um, in Riau, and I'm taking slides and information that I've used in the past from my work with Riau, what was happening in Rio? Yeah, in the 1980s, 78% of the Regency was forested, about six and a half million hectares, half of that peatland forest. In 2007, um, this was reduced by to 27% forest cover, and uh, with only about one and a half million, 1.4 million peat, and total of 2.2 million hectares um, remaining of forest cover. Today, 2014, I'm sure it's much, much less, yeah? But this is demonstrative of the land use change occurring in the province. What are the accelerators, i.e. underlying causes of this change? Industrial oil palm plantations, you know, this has been a constant development. I spent 10 years flying and traveling through Rio and, and seeing this happen. Illegal logging, rampant illegal logging, especially in the Tesonilo area, the last dry land area of Rio um, that is a focus of development. District autonomy. To me, this was the most significant thing. The independence of the people from the provincial district down to village level, a feeling of it's our time now. We can do what we want. It's my land, not the central governments. It's my land, not the companies. This is the feeling in the province. Migration from other provinces. Riau, 10 years ago, was a frontier compared to North Sumatra. People, vast movement, rapid movement of people from North Sumatra down to Riau. Developing middle class. All these big companies starting up, hiring people, well-educated people, steady jobs, steady income, extra income. They want to invest in their pensions, their, their children's future. They want to buy a car. They want to improve their livelihoods. They're buying land. Two hectares here, four hectares there. They're entering into agreements with local villagers, 50-50 cost sharing. Staff in my fire department own land in Tesonilo. Middle class, steady jobs, looking to improve their future. What I read recently, yeah, IKEA just opened in Jakarta, yeah? Why? Because there's a strong middle class in Indonesia. 74 million people have entered the middle class of Indonesia in the past 10 years. It's significant. The aim of all of this, to enhance their economic status through land acquisition and oil palm development, primarily. That's where the money is. My observations, slash and burn, the primary method. What's interesting, what I'm noticing in Jambi, there's more mechanical land clearing going on in the illegal activities. Why? They have more money <laughs> to spend on equipment. This is happening in the forest I manage now. Illegal heavy equipment coming in, clearing land, because it's faster. That's what the companies do, too. It's faster and more efficient. Costs more, but it gets you where you want to be in the long run faster. Extreme competition on the remaining natural forest. Um, this is in the case of Rio. Um, and again, this data is, this, this is dated. So, but this includes the conservation areas, i.e. Tesonilo, Kurumutan area, especially, that I'm familiar with. <coughs> At the time, 
you know, 1.8 million hectares of peatland already converted. This is the messaging and the reality that we were conveying at April. But only about 350,000 hectares of that converted land at, in the area we were discussing was actual acacia fiber. The majority of it had, had been converted to other things, oil palm, belucar, wasteland, some rubber here and there, mainly oil palm. Why does haze happen? We all know. Poverty, unclear land tenure, agrarian society, dependency upon land, traditional tool, no fear of prosecution. <clears throat> What's always happening? Well, there's dry seasons. In Riau especially, and Jambi, South Sumatra, basically two dry seasons a year. February, March, and again, June through August, September. Um, and there's three general categories. The small farmers, the shifting cultivators, small oil palm holders. There's the illegal land users, encroachers, speculators, grabbers. And then there's this new and developing one, small to medium enterprise. Wealthy gentlemen from, Bo uh, I, meant, I said Bogor, I'm sorry, from Maidan, other places, from Singapore, from Jakarta. I have personal experience with some of this. Um, investing in land in Rupad Island in Rio, in, in Teso Nilo, encouraging people to go in and work the land for them. With all of that going on, and you have a dry season and people using fire, you have an increased incidence of forest and land fires occurring. And basically with ineffective fire detection and response systems, you get the haze. When the haze gets bad enough and reaches Singapore KL, then you get the health hazards, economic losses, and political tension. Frustrating, but repeatedly happening, and more so the past couple of years than I've seen in a while. Some examples from a company expect perspective. This is an area we call Logos Estate in April. Overlapping land, the, I apologize, I'm colorblind, the pinkish, reddish color in there is all the land that April did not control in this one concession. The legend on the bottom, only 8,400 hectares the company could actually plant and control. 5,600 hectares, the darker green, was what they set aside as conservation. 20,000 hectares of this particular block they had no control of. This is where all the hot spots and the fires were occurring. <clears throat> Eventually, April got to drop all this land from their concession and reduce the size of the concession. But before they were able to drop it out of their license, they were always being accused of burning the land. When April never burned the land, it was people living in the area. Here's a physical example. This was a riparian conservation forest, acacia here, acacia in the distance, and people settle in, plant oil palm, clearing the forest, just keep moving on it. You might say, well, why didn't they stop those people? Well, then you get into the social issues. Of course we tried to stop the people. But if they're claiming the land, if the company tries to push people out, then you get the social pressures. Well, you're infringing upon their social rights. That, that's so, but then there's the inherent problem, the overlapping nature of the system here, the unclear tenure. The government gives the right to a company for the piece of land, the, the community has a claim on the land, and each one is exercising their rights now. This is the result. The company develops what it can legally, and the community come in, comes in and develops what it can opportunistically. And so you have a decrease in natural forest cover and you have an increase in fire, smoke, and haze. In the, in the, uh, in the peatlands surrounding the concessions of April in Riau, fragmented forest, um, small parcels of land being developed day by day, piece by piece. Some of this is actually in in concessions or the edges, fringes of a concession boundary, and this we would, in, we would term encroachment. Um, a lot of these old canals here are left over from when the area of land was logged by a previous Hapeha concession that is no longer active. 
Some days now it's private people building canals like this, not a big company, to access this land for, for oil palm development. As it gets drier and drier, the fires continue to spread without any control systems. Even the young oil palm burned in Rio. I saw this happen repeatedly in Siak Regency. This is a very specific case. This is a RAPP or April's concession, recently harvested the acacia outside the plantation boundary, concession boundary, this canal. This community land, I watched, this was dense forest when I first arrived in 2003. By 2006, it was gone. Community land clearing, slash and burn over a period of years. My teams, every dry season, would set up camp and have to patrol the boundary, trying to keep the people and the fires out of the concession land. Here's another angle of the same photo. This was dense forest in 2003 and 2004, gone by 2006 and 2007. Same on this side, too. <laughs> this is planted to acacia, this is planted to oil palm. Another example, overlapping permits. Just for reference, if you're familiar, this is Kurumutan area, the Kampar River, the Indragiri River. April received not April, but one of their joint ventures received a license for this uh, concession under the SRL, Sumatra Young Lestari. When they got the license, there was an overlap. The Pupadi had already given away a big chunk of ground to the former police chief of that regency. Had to sort it out. The company had a license to develop plantation, acacia plantations, but they were local licenses overlapping. And the company calls me and says, there's fires burning in there, can you please sort it out? And basically, we found canals leading into the, the concession that the former police chief had commissioned, and he was clearing forest and establishing oil palm. And yeah, the ugly nitty gritty of it, we had to pay off the former police chief for him to leave so we could develop the acacia plantation that we were given a nice national license for. And then set up a new canal system to not just drain directly out of the peat, but to the company's approach was to set up essentially terraces in the peatlands to manage water levels in the acacia plantation. Overlapping permits. Fires occurring in the concession before we had management control of the concession. The company had to take over, take responsibility and, and control this. This is what it looked like. Here's what was happening. Business as usual scenario. This is the company's efforts in a more, I would say, systematic methodology of clearing forest and, and systematically establishing the acacia plantation, but not using fire. And I'll explain why. Um, in just in a moment, though, in summary, what we found in my 10 years there is at least 70% of the fires that the fire teams responded to at April were either caused by community land clearing basically jumping over the concession boundary or land claims within the concession boundary. Another 30% were from other sources from within the concession, often, by you know, mistaken uh, problems. Cigarettes do cause fires and peat. I can vouch for that. I didn't believe it when I came to Indonesia, but I, can, I believe it now. The April, April utilized the FAO fire management actions um, principles and actions, uh, guidelines, strategic guidelines, very useful reference book for any agency in setting up a fire management system. April's fire management program was, had three premises, no burning, fire prevention, rapid response. In harvesting land, they don't need fire. In clearing land, they don't need fire. Harvesting systems were based on both manual and mechanical methods. Clearing systems primarily ba only based on mechanical methods. Huge investment cost, up to $300 per hectare or more today. Why would they invest such money to prepare land? They had to plant. They had to plant to keep supply to the mill. Why would they implement this? They need the wood. It's their raw material. Burned wood cannot be used it, at the pulp mill. It changes the chemistry of the pulping process. You can't introduce all that burned carbon 
into, this, into the system. Organic matter is better to be kept in the soil, not burned off and volatilized into the atmosphere. Any fire is a threat and disruption to operations. It's a threat to the assets, disrupts everybody's work schedules if any fire occurs. The environmental reasons, we don't want to contribute to smoke and haze that's occurring widely already in the area. But the most important reason they don't use fire, they could never accomplish their planting targets. April is planting, and most companies, and the other one, which I can't speak of because I don't, 100,000 hectares a year, they're clearing and planting to feed their mills. 100,000, if they depended on the two or three months a year where it's dry enough to burn to prepare all their land for planting, it would never happen. They have to be preparing land 24-7, 365 to keep planting trees to get their planting targets done each year. So fire is not an option for land preparation. And I'll tell you another reason why, because they they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't be investing all the money they did that I asked them to when I worked there in fire suppression. Yeah, the, the teams had targets and objectives for detection, initial attack, to help give them focus and attention and motivation. We had goals set out to in all fires at less than 10 hectares. And this was achieved over 90% of the time each year, depending upon the weather. Systems such as fire danger rating systems to, to monitor weather and to give us an early warning of the, of, the, of, the, of the impending weather changes and fuel availability. Um, what we found over time, you know, 48% of the fires always occur in the high to extreme periods of the year, usually July, August, September. And that's when 81% of the hectares burned would occur. This is 2009 data for monitoring weather and fire danger. Like I said a moment ago, the companies do invest heavily. I can say April did, and I, be, I believe they continue to um, in people, training, equipment, um, and systems. That's why they hired me to come in there, was to, to, to push this forward. Um, I'll say something on the side. APP is seeking help right now. They've lost a lot of hectares this year. They, their system has somewhat collapsed. I don't know if anybody's from APP here, but they're admitting that, and they're looking for help right now. What did April have by the time I left? Yeah, lots of people, lots of backup firefighters, regular employees, you know, all the training and other things like this. Uh, invested over $2 million in basic equipment, hoses and pumps and things like this, so they could respond effectively, transport, boats and pickup trucks. Helicopters, um, two of them now they have, and we, were, we had a $1.2 million a year budget just for fire management in the, in the company to deal with that land base I showed you a map, map on earlier. Other things the company would do, which as a fire manager I had input to, was to ensure green belts were maintained. Yeah, I mean, it's another sort of indirect system of fire control to kind of minimize fire spread. And this worked on several occasions. When fires did get large, we kept them from getting larger by having green belts within our, in our concessions. This is one that follows a riparian zone, of course. But this is one that just is, was placed in the peatlands just to break up the legally allowed large area that could be harvested. And so this particular green belt here is 400 meters wide. It connects the Kampar peat dome, which is here, to a river can't recall the river now, um, but it was a, basically a travel corridor slash fire break in the middle of a 15 kilometer long clear cut. We had several of these in that clear cut. Dry land, same thing, you know, mosaic of uh, natural forest combined with acacia on the ridge tops. The, the natural forest that remains was in the riparian zones. The fire threat came from outside the plantations. Again, here's the acacia, the boundary line of the concession, land development outside the boundary, burning right up to the edge by the communities. If you will, this is APL land on the outside. This is Hutan Produksi on the, on the right side. And occasionally, 30% of the time, I'd say, on average, um, there was a fire within the concession started by 
you know, uh, unthinking contractor, accidental, you know, something like this. But with systems in place to monitor the weather, to do patrols, you can respond to these things and control them well. The difference is this is an unwanted fire. Back here, it's a wanted fire. This is serving a purpose for the, for the person who lives in this house. He was waving at us the day we flew by. Yeah, don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> you know, this is serving a purpose for that individual. It serves no purpose for the company. The hotspot may show up in the company's land because of geo, geo rectification on the GIS data, but this is the reality on the ground. We did a little analysis in April in 2009, looking at the hotspot data within the concessions and outside the concession boundaries. <coughs> looking at the, the end point was looking at the, uh, trying to compare managed landscape, i.e. April's land, to unmanaged, i.e. community land. <coughs> Overall in the province, half a hotspot would occur on every thousand hectares. In Rokan Hill here, it was the highest frequency hotspot regency in the, in the province. Palelawan, where most of April's land was located, had a significantly high frequency of hotspots as well. In April's land, the undeveloped portions, which I described to you previously, had a fairly high frequency of hotspots because of individuals util utilizing and developing the land for their benefits. <clears throat> Within the managed areas of the plantations and conservation areas, April's hotspot count was somewhat lower. And there's still georectification misalignments that can account for some of these as well, but not, and many false positives I would find as well, especially in the peatlands with canals and things, reflectances, I guess. Moving on to uh, Huftan Harapan, Harapan Rainforest, Jambi and Samsel. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the purpose or, or, or no knowledgeable about ecosystem restoration. Hutan Harapan was the first restoration concession in Indonesia. It's 98,000 hectares of Sundaic lowland forests. This represents, we believe today, 25% of the remaining lowland forest in Sumatra. I would seek assistance in trying to quantify, specify this number better, looking at Tesonilo and other areas of similar forest. Very high biodiversity values remain. We have over 1,350 species identified of plants, animals, mammals, and birds. Um, we are developing a model for sustainable NTFP business, or HAHABEKA, non-timber forest products. But we're doing this, <coughs> excuse me, within a very challenging landscape for land pressures in Hutan Harapan. Our vision at Harapan Rainforest is to protect and restore Indonesia's forest for future needs, not to lock it up, but to recognize the restoration need today so that it can continue to be utilized in the future in various ways. Just a little more explanation, Harapan Rainforest is a consortium of three NGOs, Borong Indonesia here in Bogor, the RSPB in the United Kingdom, and BirdLife International as the umbrella organization. This is a June 2013 map of Harapan Rainforest. I'm sure you can see what the differences are. This is all open land encroached. Some up here, a majority of it in this area. Relatively good forest compared to the encroached zones, um, but all of it in some state of degradation, no primary forest left. Our best forest is located um, in this area in the upper reaches of the Lalan River. What we have inside are 200 indigenous families, mainly in the northern boundary and a few in the middle. 2,500 migrant families estimated to now be living inside Hutan Harapan. Migrated from Java, Bali, via Lampung, and North Sumatra, and Western Jambi as well. And we are an island of natural forest surrounded by a production landscape of rubber, and oil palm uh, concessions. As of uh, last month, September, unfortunately, there's been 20,000 hectares deforested over since 2000 in the past seven years. The colored areas show the time 
and the deforestation that's occurred through encroachment. Some of this is well-planned, well-orchestrated, and well-financed. The hotspots that occur in, in PT Recce all occur in the encroached zone. We're a concession, just like April. We're not clearing land with fire. We have no reason to. It's people who are encroaching the land and claiming land that are using fire. This is an interesting one. This is a summary of hotspot data from 2008 to 12. Here's Harapan Rainforest. Relatively no hotspots in the forest except in the encroached zones, which I showed you a moment ago. Outside, significant amount of fire activity. Again, doing a hotspot frequency analysis for Harapan. In, uh, in the three districts that Harapan is affiliated with, this is the hotspot frequency per thousand hectares. Musibanyuasen in South Sumatra, hotspot frequency about the same. In the encroached area of Harapan, I don't like showing this, but it demonstrates the intense pressure there is on natural forest and the, and the focused um, efforts of encroachment that are occurring. We have a very high hotspot count per thousand hectares over the past five years. In the areas of land within Harapan, we define as not being actively encroached very low hotspot count. <clears throat> a little bit about, you know, at Recce we've developed a fire management system that the scale and needs of, of what Recce needs, similar to that what April had. I worked in both places, so we have the same equipment, um, same type of systems of fire danger rating and, and training and everything else um, to be able to respond to fires. The problem is, at both April and Recce, you don't respond to fires in the encroach zones. They've already claimed the land, they've already cleared the forest, they've already planted the royal palm. If you go in there to spray fires out, they raise up their parangs and they say, get out. This is our land, not yours. So we fight, we fight fires along the edges, trying to reduce the expansion of the frontier. Deep inside the middle, you can't do anything more about it. You call the police, you're wasting your dime sometimes. Um, Summary. The current forest and land fires are indirectly attributed to decentralization of national legal structures which have empowered individuals to develop land in the regencies. Land clearing fires will continue for as long as regency governments enable land use change and fail to enforce regulations. A complex web of behind the scenes players exists that leads to land development and eventual land clearing fires. Rural poor seeking land for livelihood enhancement are the igniters of these land clearing fires. Encroachment of idle, unmanaged or unused land, i.e. natural forest, within and outside concessions is the largest cause of smoke and haze. Fire suppression systems can minimize losses to specific assets. Rapid response to all fires is the key to mitigating 90% of the fires on the concession lands. Summary of my experiences in these three areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian.